welcome to Just Minding My Business Radio, where we are moving at the speed of God, learning what we didn't know we didn't know. I'm your host, Ida Crawford. And I'm your co-host, Ruth Haskins. So grab a pen and paper and get ready for information that you can use. Welcome, everyone, to Just Minding My Business Media. We hope your day was filled with good things leading to positive experiences. Coming to the mic, we have Dwayne Williams, Jr. He is a native of Baltimore, Maryland. He is a minister, motivational speaker, activist, mentor, and coach who has dedicated himself to the youth with empowering them spiritually and naturally. His voice is influential influential to the right now generation. Duane is very passionate about healthy development for the youth, to prepare them for their future and equipping them with the tools they need to succeed. Duane served as a community outreach director for Sharper Minds Consultant, which aspires to educate individuals on dating and domestic violence. And so much more. So we'll learn all about Dwayne. Welcome, Dwayne. How are you? Thank you, ladies, for having me. I greatly appreciate hanging out with you guys tonight. Well, welcome. 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 Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you for taking the time out of your very busy schedule. Oh, no. Never too busy. Never too busy, but uh, <laughs> definitely making it happen. I appreciate you guys. Okay. I appreciate you. So how did you get on this road to where you are now? What led uh, you? Uh, you know, truth be uh, told, um, you know, I started out uh, in the church like many people do, and um, I felt my drive and my passion, and I felt my heart really grow for a thing. You know, it's like when a kid starts to play something, and he comes back home, and he tells mom, he says, hey, I don't want to do this anymore because I'm not really feeling it. Or they come home and be like, hey, I really like this because I'm really feeling it. That's what it was for me. Um, I believe I saw a lot of lack, uh, a lot of areas that youth needed to grow. Uh, I was a youth at the time and I needed to grow. And because of different parameters surrounding the church world at that present time, uh, they didn't allow us to do some things because they felt as though it wasn't in the right context or the right movement with uh, where uh, the church was going. And so uh, my heart began to grow and my mind began to grow and my passion began to grow, my desire began to grow um, in developing and helping youth become who they are uh, through spiritual and natural uh, principles. Well, we're going to come back to the spiritual and natural principles. I think that's really important. Uh, I want to ask you one thing right away. You are influential in the right now generations. What is the right now generation? What does that mean? I believe that the generation, uh, the millennial generation is the right now generation. And what I mean by that is is, uh, no disrespect or putting out the mature generation because we need you guys to teach us the way. However, when I'm talking about the right now generation, it is the millennial generation that is really coming into their own. Uh, It is the generation that is learning how to be uh, greater than our grandparents, greater than our mothers and fathers, greater than uh, those before us. And like I said, it does not put out the mature generation or the generations before us, but it is the generation now that is uh, ascending into roles like uh, uh, congressmen and councilwomen and councilmen and uh, ascending into roles as principals and teachers and great chiefs of police departments around this country. Uh, what we're seeing is the millennial generation uh, stepping into, I don't want to say uh, replacing, but stepping into um, the next dimension or the next level of of different career brackets and they are taking it to a whole nother level. So when I talk about the right now generation, I'm talking about the millennial generation, the youth who are stepping into their call and their duties and their assignments and their destiny. Okay. That's good to know. 
because actually that's just as it's supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> I agree. I agree. You know, it has to be. The older generation has to teach what they know. Yes, ma'am. Then you, the older generation does move back because it just has to be. That's the way life is. And what's important about what you're talking about is the fact that you believe that right now is the time to really start training these young ones so that they are prepared to step into these positions, yes. not just sort of roll into them. They have to really be prepared. Yes. Let's talk yes. about that preparation. What does that look like? What are the tools that you use? You talk about natural tools. Yeah. Yeah, you know, that's a great question. Um, Dr. Uh, Miles Monroe, uh, he wrote this in a book. He said he had a dream one time of a famous track star runner who was running and collapsed and died. And he said at the funeral, uh, what happened was so many people were coming from far and near to um, see uh, this, this track star in the casket and they had him dressed in his track uniform and they had the baton in his hand and he was laying in the casket. And uh, now, once again, this is Dr. Miles Monroe having a dream about this, right? He, he then says um, um, a young boy came to the casket and everybody was looking like, what is this young boy doing? What is he doing? Why is he doing this? And he said that the young boy was prying the baton out of his hand, out of the track star hand. And he said he woke up from the dream in that moment. And he said the revelation that he got from that was that this generation had the baton, but had no direction in which way to run. What does that mean? To me, that means that preparation for us means that we give the next generation tools, whether it be financial tools, whether it be moral tools, whether it be emotional tools, whether it be pra practical tools, whatever that is, we give those, we give this generation the tools to be successful for the future. That means teaching them what we know about a thing. I told a young man today, I said, it is wrong of us as a culture, as an African-American culture to learn things and not teach people things remember back in the day they used to be like uh, i got my mama's recipe and uh it took you a long time to get that recipe why because our mothers and grandmothers and those people who had certain recipes they did not want to share them because they wanted to be the creator of that of that cake or of that um, um item that they were making well mm -hmm. that's not the time that we live in anymore we've got to teach people how to do it so that they can recreate it but also recreate it in such a way that is relative for a time is now and so i believe preparation is about teaching it is about teaching the tools to be successful that if you're going to be an entrepreneur these are the things that you need if you're going to be a pastor these are the things that you need if you're going to be a teacher these are the things that you need. Schooling is great, but there's also an environment outside of schooling that we need to be prepared for. And one of the things that I understand and know is that we don't really prepare us as a culture. We don't prepare the next uh, to take over because we think that we are going to be doing it for such a long time and we miss the moment in preparing so mm -hmm. that way our legacy don't die. That, that way, that way, that way, the community doesn't miss uh, uh, what they need. When people hold on to things, what they do is they stop things from growing. Uh -huh. And one, come on, y'all, hear me tonight. They, they stop things from growing. And when you stop things from growing, what you do is hinder growth. Growth has to happen. So either you can teach it or you can keep the baton in your hand. And when we come and take the baton out of your hand, then you are guilty of not giving us the minerals and the vitamins to grow into the next place that we are to grow into. I totally agree with that. I definitely okay. agree because one of the things that I've noticed is traditions aren't getting passed down. I noticed that some some years ago. You know, your grandmother did certain things, like a family kind of thing that was sort of a ritual within the family. And I noticed that these things aren't getting passed down from generation to generation. And that kind of bothered me because I'm like, okay, 
uh, why aren't you, pay, why, why are we doing that? I have grandchildren and I have great grandchildren and I've taught them everything I know survival skills things that they're going to need it's okay to be beautiful but at the end of the day you're going to have to eat you're going to have to manage your money sometimes you're going to have some sometimes you have a little bit you need to be able to work on both sides of the spectrum but i noticed that a lot of times things aren't getting shared passed down from generation to generation and i don't know it's if it's because I'm not sure what it is, actually. I think it's our mentality. I think it's the way that we think. Um, if you look inside of the Caucasian household, most of the time or some of the time, you will find, or a great percentage of the time, you will find that they are not afraid to pass down their money, pass down their businesses, pass down their legacy, right? Because they know that if I keep creating something for the next generation to pick up, that we will continue to make an impact on whatever society that we are in. Mm -hmm. um, a part of our culture is that we do great with the struggle, mm -hmm. right? We do great with surviving, but we aren't teaching people that we don't need to just survive. We can actually live and be okay with living if we just teach. I love this Bible verse, and I'm not going to Bible y'all to death. I love this Bible verse. It says to train a child in the way they should go. Right. For when they get older, they shall never depart. Now, most people take that scripture, and they run so many different ways. Here's my uh, theology behind the scripture is that not only are we teaching the principle of spirituality to our children, but we've also got to teach them the spirit of practicality. And what happens to most people is we do well at teaching people how to be spiritual. We teach, uh, we, we do well at teaching people how to survive. Look, girl, put these beans in a cup, put these hot dogs in a cup. Look, put that together and let the children eat. But what we ought to be teaching now is how to live past survival, how yes. to live, like how to have things saved. And I believe that teaching doesn't come by all the time the way of yelling and disciplining, but teaching comes by a way of sitting down and explaining. And I think communication and talking has to be an avenue in the black household now for us to continue to do better in the community, in the family, as husband and wives, as pastors, as uh, community leaders. We have to communicate and talk. And even when adversity comes up, we still have to use the lane of communication to become better. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, you've hit on so many points, mm -hmm. and one of them is uh, about how we, where do we go from now? We've come through hundreds of years of struggle. Okay, we got that down to perfection. But so often, what I don't see are, let's say my, I'll even say my generation, having created businesses that they can pass down to their children. Like you have so many people who have, um, there's just so many things. We need so many different things. And I know this is my little hobby horse. I know I'm going to jump on it for just a second. But one thing that we don't have is land. Land. We, do, we yes. don't know how to, we don't, have land to live on our own land we don't own land to live on we don't own land to build on and therefore we're always going somewhere else to rip something from somebody else so many as you brought out very clearly in other races they will teach their children about business they will teach them about having about money how to handle money what to do with money what money is and what money isn't they will teach so that I just watched a really good um, YouTube uh, video a couple of days ago, and this puts it in perspective. An older man, probably in his 80s or 90s, teaching mm -hmm. his son and his grandchildren, 
and great grandchildren how to build a simple house in less than a week. And when they finished with it, it was absolutely livable, totally insulated, and they were doing it in a very cold climate. Those are the kind of skills that we have not learned. We've been so busy struggling, we've forgotten about the simple things that we need to know. And we've forgotten how to pass mm. those things on. Uh, mm. And as a result, our young ones don't have anything that they can, that they can call their own. They really don't. Mm -hmm. They don't have skills. You know, college and education and all that's well, and it's important. But you also need practical skills. And that's you need practical you skills, yes, ma'am. That they don't have. And I guess that's what I want to ask you. Uh, there's so many things. I heard your conversation with the young girls at the uh, Princess Within Young Girls Leadership. Ah, uh, yes, ma'am. And, okay, those were, believe it or not, practical skills that you were talking to them about. And they were about safety, but in a very, very up front way. It wasn't anything yes, all it, airy fairy up there in the air. It was like really down to earth. That's yes. what I don't hear anymore. I don't hear that from parents. Mm. I don't hear it from anybody. It's like, oh. mm. so I'm going to stop talking and let you talk about that because this is where you absolutely shine. You shine. You know, you know, to really answer that, um, many people used to tell me they used to say, you talk too much. <laughs> oh, here we are, right? Yeah. Um, and I don't shy away from it now. Um, I'm lucky that the Lord really gave me a bold personality. Not everybody's built this way. Not everybody can have this kind of personality. And it's no shame to them because God built us in the way that he needs us to be for the path that he has taken us on. However, I am bold like this because remember in the beginning of this interview, I talked about the fact that um, I grew up in a church who really didn't, it was really great. Spiritually, it was really great. However, practical, uh, they really didn't allow us to do much because of whatever they were thinking and how it could shape us. Um, and that's no indictment against them. However, I saw uh, many of the young people that grew up with me um, kind of have moments of failure, a lot of moments of failure, and even myself have a moment of failure because we did not address the practicality, right? And I remember when I first started going into schools and speaking, one of the first things I said to my mentor, who was a woman at that time, and she brought me in to the school system and really started pushing me. And once she seen how much people started enjoying my conversation, she really started pushing me. I made a declaration to myself that I would not be an individual that did not give the truth. Whether it hurt people's feelings or not, I would not be that individual. And I learned that because I was me and unapologetic and bold in my approach, that it was helping people. So when you say like, hey, he, he gave it to him at a real deal and it wasn't airy, it wasn't up in the air, that's who I am. Why? Because we have enough, and this is no, once again, this is no indictment against anybody. But I believe that the political speech has ruined us as people. Everything that we say now is political. And if you don't say it like this, people get offended. If you say it like this, people get offended. And I'm not trying to be harsh, nor am I a harsh person. I'm, I'm just a bold person. And here's what I know. Back in the day, right, there was a little kid who was like seven years old. And uh, I was probably like 18. And I walked up on him and I was talking to him. And he said, sir, no disrespect. You're a nice man, but your breath stinks, right? <laughs> and <laughs> and uh, it, listen, it made me laugh, but it was so real. How could I get mad at that when that was real? I think what we have done as individuals is that we have erased our realness from our humanity and allow all this political speech political conversation, political mindset come in us to the point where we can't even be real with people and it's not helping people leave where they are and come into where they need to be. I made a declaration that as long as I speak, talk, 
that I would not be ignorant, but that I would be real because in order, I learned this, in order to move society from one place to the next place, they need to know the truth. And whenever you give people false ideology, false practicality, false thinking, false, uh, false maturity, whenever you give people anything false, they can never grow. See, one thing I learned about Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Harriet Tubman, just from reading, they gave people the truth even when they did not want to hear it. Right. That's right. We, listen, and I'm, I'm, just, I'm just speaking from my heart tonight. We have destroyed our world with political talking. We have destroyed our world with political thinking. We need the truth. I mean the truth. And the truth isn't always good, bad, ugly, or indifferent. It is just the truth. If I walk into your house and you got red carpet on your floor, it's red carpet. It's just the truth. Mm-hmm. We've got to be mature enough people to handle the truth, even when we don't like it, deal with it, process it, and become better. So one of the things I think that is important for us as people is to really understand the truth. And the truth is that crime is not all the police fault. Come on, y'all. Crime. Come on. Come on. See, this is this is the stuff we gotta say. And we gotta be real. People like, look, <laughs> it's not, yeah, there are there are problems inside of the police department that need to be fixed, but it's our sons, it's our nephews, it's our cousins, it's our uh uh black men who are pulling the trigger. So how do we address the issue that lives inside of them to where we get them to understand that life is more important than taking life? Yeah. How, do, how do we get them to understand to attack okay. the root of the problem and stop programming our people to death? One thing that I realized about Baltimore City, we have enough programs. <laughs> we have a lot of resources. But uh-huh. what are we doing to attack the root of the problem? And the root of the problem is not just pro- a poverty. The root of the problem is poverty. It's anger. It's multi-layered, multi-faceted problems. And if we don't attack the root, tell me this. That's if a, when you have a baby and the baby is crying, there's three reasons why a baby is crying. Either the baby is hungry, either the baby is wet, or even the baby is sleeping. But once you find out what that reason is, what happens to the baby? They cease crying. What am I saying? When we attack the issues that live at the root of the problem, we impact young people, we change our city, we change our nation, we change our culture, and we bring us to a place of healing and restoration. Mm -hmm. I understand my assignment. My assignment is to restore and heal. You're looking at a man who has lost a lot in the last couple of years because of decisions I have made. Come on, y'all hear me? Like, you hear that? Taking ownership. Decisions I have made has caused me to lose a lot. But here's the thing. I remember one thing, that you can lose it, but you can always gain it back. And when you recognize that you can always gain it back, you change the game plan to get where you need to be again. Mm-hmm. Truth. You you have spoken absolute truth. Yes. And I appreciate it so much. And this goes along. I looked at your website, and let me see if I can find this real fast. <laughs> yes, man. <ma'am. laughs> on your website, one of the first things that caught my eye is this quote from you. Yes, ma'am. While we do not always possess the power to change our circumstances, we always possess the power to change ourselves. And that's what you're talking about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yes. That's exactly, I, I've, I've taken that quote. I, I remember uh, when I was going through my season of my own stuff, and uh, one of the things that I had to look at um, and go back and check, I was like, wow. I don't really have the power to always change my circumstance, right? Um, um, having repossessions, you know, losing money, um, uh, 
almost losing some portion of my mind, right? <laughs> uh, uh, be, because when you start to lose, listen, let's be honest tonight. When you start to lose items as a man, I ain't talking about as a woman. I'm talking about as a man. Mm-hmm. It doesn't define us, but it does kind of make us. And mm-hmm. so when you start to lose stuff as a man, you begin to be like, man, what, what in the world is this? Like when you start to lose stuff, you start to look at things and you realize something. I can change some of the issues in my circumstance, but I can't change all of them. But what I can change is myself. Remember, we talked about practicality, changing yourself. How do I change myself inside of a circumstance? That means I learn how to budget differently so that I don't have to experience any more repossession. Mm -hmm. You understand? That's changing yourself, Right. right? I understand that if I know I get a quick temper over something that is mild, right? But it's a pet peeve of mine. I understand now that I remove myself from that situation because I don't want to spare up in that way. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? I recognize, I recognize that in myself, if I find myself in a place where I'm feeling a certain kind of way to back off sometimes and then come back. So in every situation, like you don't have the power to always change your situation, but inside of your situation, you can change you. And when you change you, then you can look at the situation differently. See, when I looked at the repossession, I was like, okay, I get it now. Because, because what happened was I wasn't thinking, right? We talk, we're talking about legacy. I wasn't thinking about my future in my past. I was spending in my past, but not thinking about my future because I wasn't game planning. See, that's when you start to change yourself because now you say, hold up. I won't experience that again because I know I'm planning for my future, mm-hmm. changing yourself inside of your circumstance. Yeah. And then yeah. learning that lesson that everything brings. Yes. Learning that yes. lesson. Yes. Yes. Learning, learning the lesson. I think one of the hardest things for people to do is to step back and learn the lesson. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Um, because the lesson, it doesn't always show up with balloons and flowers. Uh, no. <laughs> you bet. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Come you better the believe lesson, it. <laughs> the lesson That's doesn't right. al- the, the lesson doesn't <laughs> always show up with balloons and flowers. Sometimes the lesson shows up so subtle. But what you have to do is be so keen to yourself that you go, this, this is a lesson. And you got to get excited about it because you're like, okay, 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 God. Yep, yeah, yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. This is the lesson. I got you. I got you. So you start moving differently because you're like, okay, this is the lesson. So let me prove, um, let me prove to God in this moment, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is where it's at. Uh-huh. Yep. Because those yeah. lessons are what make us grow. Right. Sometimes the, the the hardest lessons are the ones that are the greatest lessons. They're the ones that make us grow mentally, emotionally, and above Oof. all spiritually. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah, those ones, you really have to get down all on your time. knees and yes. have to ask the God of your understanding to please help me yes. open up my eyes, yes. my ears, my heart, so I get it, so I can yes. get it and hold on to it. Yes, yes. Uh, I, I think always one of the best being things. pruned. It's like sometimes lessons are like it's like pruning a tree yes. or a bush. Yes. You know, you want the best fruit from a vine, it has to be pruned. Yes. And that's that's my analogy of lessons. Uh, agree. Big and small. Agree. And you and Agreed. you're right. They don't come with balloons and flowers. They don't come with balloons and flowers. I've never seen them come with balloons and flowers. <laughs> <laughs> I've not seen no. one yet. They actually no. quite painful. <laughs> yeah, thorns. Yeah, they Ashes. Whatever. Yes, ma'am. Yes, but, ma'am. You know, you're just such a dynamic young man. You really are. And you bring so much to what you do. I was so impressed when I was listening to you talking to those girls. Because you Thank were telling you. them Thank even you. about their personal safety. And I, one thing that I really love that you said you you were talking to the girls and you said you know you were talking about sexual maturity really and you were saying to them you know you're all coming to an age when boys are going to start talking to you yes ma'am they're going to start stepping to you what what are you going to do yes ma'am you know how many possibly of the girls in that room do not have a male figure in their life that is telling them that 
and yes. saying, expect it, and this is what you do. Yes. You don't have to give in to it. Yes. Because that's a point of departure in their life. Yes. That if they don't get that lesson. Yes, ma'am. Their whole lives, the whole, their whole lives can just take a turn that is so hard to come back from. So I just I appreciated that so much. It was like, yes, tell them the truth. Yes. You're young and you're cute and you think that he's just that little boy over there is just he's talking to me. It's like, yeah, and so. Yeah. <laughs> you know, because you know, here's the thing. Oftentimes uh we see an African American male like myself, and there's a lot of great ones out here. Uh, working with young boys, and we box us in. Uh, we, oh, let's just bring them to speak to the boys. But in all actuality, I'm telling people like, yes, I want to speak to the boys, but I want to speak to the girls too. And the reason why I want to speak to the girls is not to say don't like a boy. I'm saying manage it well. You understand what I'm saying? Like, yes. I'm saying, see, I'm saying for a boy not to like a girl, but just manage it well. See, what we don't teach, see, this is a part of the scripture when Jesus was saying, hey, look, teach, train your children. It was saying, teach them how to manage themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Teach them how to manage their emotion, their physical being, their spiritual being. Teach them how to manage themselves. Yes, they're not going to always get it right, but if you do a great job at teaching, they will remember something that will stick with them and it will help preserve them and keep them out of certain situations. How do I know? I'm an example of that. Yeah, I did mischievous things when I was growing up, but I never did major things. And it didn't make me better than another person. But what I'm saying is uh, my mother taught me some valuable things to help preserve me. And I can say with an honest heart that the mistakes that I made you know, it wasn't detrimental to my life, right? It wasn't, it, it didn't wipe me out and send me off to La La Land and never coming back. You know what I mean? It, 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 it was a moment. I got myself together and, and we made positive impact after that. And I think that uh, what, what we are challenged with now in the Black culture is teaching our children how to manage better, how to, how to manage adults better, right? I see so many kids now that if you're not their parent, they cuss you out, right? Uh, if, if you're not, if you, but back in the day, it wasn't about that. It was just about the fact that if you were an adult, period, right? And that's what we got to get back to teaching them is managing. And managing is nothing more than respecting. And we teach them how to respect. Then we teach them how to have more values for everything around them. I mean, yeah. I disagree with grown adults growing up too, but I mumbled it underneath my breath and walked into the <laughs> That's other room. Right. See, I didn't have the galls. Your life depended on you being I, I quiet about it. I, I didn't have the galls to say it out loud. And I mean, and I know now times have changed and I'm all for the new parenting of parents sitting down with their children and allowing their children to voice their concerns and be, being open with their parents because I think that is uh, essential and important because that wasn't, given to me growing up and I wish that we did kind of have that but however there still needs to be a teaching of respect and what they also need to see is you as the adult as the parent show that same respect even in high intensity situations my mm -hmm. mother if she disagreed with the principals and the teachers she never or even if it was my father come on let's talk real today right even if it was my father she never allowed us to see her disagree with another adult because it was not okay for us to do it that is huge yeah that is absolutely huge uh i totally agree with that and in some cultures that i am very privilege to be a part of, uh, the issue of respect is major. Major. Even in the way you greet someone, and I'm talking about, a, I'm part of a foreign language group, and to hear that the way that one adult greets another adult, how younger people greet older ones, how younger ones, if, they're, if they have older siblings, there is a way of greeting them. And if you don't, oh my goodness, it's like you have created a major crime. <laughs> yes, it's, indeed. It's, it's a major issue. Yes, you know, indeed. Uh, the way children greet an adult, or even for myself, I'm a mature woman, but if there's someone older than I am, there's a way in which I have to greet them. Yes, ma'am. And it's a matter of showing respect. Yes, ma'am. And it, it makes so much order. It, there's order in the culture. 
disorder in the way that children grow up. And just like you were saying, there were certain things that you would, did not dare to say. Yeah. You might have thought it, <laughs> but you weren't going to let it come out of your mouth. True that. Yeah. <laughs> and nowadays, sometimes I am just shocked at some of the things that come out of children's mouths. It's like, really? Oh my goodness, I would not have lived to, <laughs> to have told the story. I would it's a different my world. Mother, you know, <laughs> when I was coming up, she if she lived in these times, she would have life in prison. <laughs> From the way she raised up. Oh, she, yeah. It'd be a lot of people with life yeah, in prison. She yeah. would be life in prison. <laughs> wow. This but is you so... know what? Most of us can, can say that when we had that type of discipline, most of us can say that it did not harm us. Right. It has. Right. It made us better people. It gave us um, a... A better structure. We knew what our boundaries Better structure. Were. Yeah, better structure. A structure. Definitely. That's it. Yes. We had yes. structure. So we knew how far to go. We knew what to say, what not to say. And I can remember my mother saying, you know, after she did what she had to do and I was sniffling and whining on the way, she said, just, I don't even want to hear you sniffle. Yeah. <laughs> There's plenty more where that came from. Yeah. You know what? It was like, it felt so horrible at the time, but you know what? I have no wounds from that. I have no wounds because nine times out of 10, I was wrong. <laughs> I knew I was wrong when right. I was doing whatever it was that she had to correct me for. Right. Nowadays, I think sometimes children don't know what is right and what's wrong. Do you ever get that impression that sometimes they may uh, know it inside, but they don't know how to act on what's right? No, that's it. That's it. Um, I think that kids do know right from wrong. Uh, they just don't always do it. And in, in some way, shape, or form, if we're being honest, I haven't always done it. Um, we as people haven't always done it. I think the issue becomes not necessarily uh, what they know. It is going back to the teaching. It is us as parents and teachers and adults to teach them how to have determination to do it. See, okay. Here's, 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 and I'll give you this short story, and I know we got to get out of here, right? Um, when, when one time my friends, they were going in the Exxon gas station, and God knows I'm a cake fan. I, I love Little Debbie's, okay? Uh, they, they, <laughs> <laughs> they, y'all laughing. They, they migrated out of Little Debbie's. Uh, they don't taste too good anymore, so I stay away from them. But I love cake, period. And I remember, you know, growing up, um, my mother had but didn't have it. Sometimes she couldn't give. Because it, it might have been, you know, in between we. And so some other kids were fortunate to have a little bit more than we were. And so I remember they used to be like, man, we're going down the store. And I'm like, okay, cool. Y'all buy me something because I ain't got no money. Like, yeah, we're going to buy you something. But that wasn't the intent. The intent was to steal. So when we got there in that moment and it was kind of like, hey, we ain't buying nothing. We steal and we grabbing and running. The determination in my mind went a couple ways. One, I was thinking about, man. Like, what is my mother going to do to me if I get caught right. by the police, right? <laughs> Two, what is the police going to do to me if I get caught by the police, right? Three, I just don't want these problems. I, I'm trying to live without all of these problems, right? So it was my determination in that moment that once we got to the threshold of the store that I left. Now, I heard all kinds of names. Yo, you a clown. You a sucker. You left us. You ain't our boy. I, I would rather deal with that for a week than to deal with having a criminal background because I decided to make a decision that was just ultimately stupid. And so I think the issue is that kids do know right from wrong. The problem is we have to teach them how to be determined to do right. Mm. I want to say that one more time. How to be determined to do Right, because can, can I just be on their side for a moment and I'm always on their side? Doing right in today's society, when we talked about peer pressure back in the day, mm -mm, it's escalated times yes. 10. Yes. And peer pressure now will have a child believing that if they don't do wrong, they can never be cool. So what we have yeah, to right. teach our children is how to be determined and that you are still cool even if you choose right. That's right. And so that's where we are.
That's right. Awesome. That's, That's what right. we are. That's absolutely wow. awesome. Thank so, y'all, man. I love y'all. <laughs> <laughs> love you. I love you. My goodness. So let me ask you before we get into another round, how do people get in touch with you? That's a great question. How do people get in touch with me? I'm glad you asked. Uh, I have a couple projects that I'm working on. Um, so here's how people can mainly get in contact with me. One, via social media. So we'll start with Facebook. Facebook is uh, my entire name, Dwayne Williams Jr. That's D-U-A-N-E Williams J-R on Facebook. On Instagram, it is D Williams, W-I-L-L-I-A-M-S underscore Jr. That's on Instagram. Uh, my website is my entire name, DwayneWilliamsJr.com. Okay. And then uh, I'm trying to forget. Oh, then you can always hit my email. Okay. Let me give that too. It is my entire name, uh, Dwayne Williams Jr., the number 11 at gmail.com. And so uh, I, I would love for people to reach out to me. I tell people all the time, uh, it is not about money for me. Uh, it is really about impact. So if it's your community event, if it's graduations, last year I had the pleasure of speaking at uh, a great deal of graduations. Friday I'm speaking at an inauguration for seniors, uh, and I am so happy about that because no matter what environment I go in, uh, I know that the schools aren't really uh, Jesus-prone, and that's okay. Uh, but, however, I know how to still give a message uh, without – uh, given too much of that because I have to be respectful of the environment. And so I tell people all the time, whether it's community, church, I want to come. If we got to pull chairs around in a circle, I want to come and impact children's lives because I think what we need is not another individual that is praising their culture because that's good that we praise their culture. We need individuals that are challenging their well-being. Because praising your culture is always going to happen because black kids are always going to do great things. Trust me, it's more to come. What we need is individuals challenging who they are at the very depths of who they are, challenging their behavior, challenging their mindsets, and pulling them into a place where they say to themselves, you know what, I made some decisions that were not really who I'm really called to be, but now I'm getting ready to make some decisions that. I, it's who I'm called to be. We got other ethnicities, other children, other ethnicities who are on their way to being millionaire statuses, who are entrepreneurs at the age of 12, 15, and 17. Why? Because it's where their focus is. So all we got to do now is we don't need to address how great their culture is. We don't need to address how great their talents is. We need to challenge them to use those abilities and when they use those abilities it will bring them into a place of destiny mm -hmm. wow Oof. I, I can't say nothing after that <laughs> yeah. that, that's that's a, oh Oof. i guess that's a wrap I yeah, I, I greatly, I greatly appreciate y'all. I, I want to plug this. Um, if you're from Baltimore, I'm actually currently running for city councilman in the 13th district of Baltimore City, uh, which is East Baltimore and beyond. Uh, I will. Uh, it, it, it consists of about 13 communities, mainly East Baltimore. Um, well, all of East Baltimore, okay. and uh, I am running. And uh, I'm looking to do some of these same things that I've already been doing. Uh, if I get in doing some of these same things in the office and more, uh, because I believe, and I told my team this, that my campaign is not about what I can do. It's really about restoration. Uh, we have a city that needs inward healing and with inward healing uh, brings about results for public showcase. And I think to get public showcase, We've got to start with inward healing. We've got to attack the roots of the problems and um, not just the crime, and not, but the root, the inward root of a person. Uh, we can, if we can restore them and get them to believe again, then we can get them to be better uh, people in society and help produce better things in society and help produce at home and produce in their families and produce with their children. Uh, but we got to get them to believe again. And so I, you know, I'm, I'm challenged with that test. I don't know what nobody else is doing. I'm concerned about what I'm doing, and I'll let the chips fall where they may and uh, see what happens in April. 
that's awesome to hear. Yeah. Yes, that is ma'am. really awesome to hear because I yes, think ma'am. you are a great leader and I think you would lead Baltimore in the right direction. So I'm happy to hear that. Mm-hmm. I, I'm going to try my best. Uh, my, my goal is to really uh, make an impact that will have people believing that we're all in this. I, I said this years ago is that uh, we can't change Baltimore by ourselves. The days of Martin Luther King, one of my mentors, Dr. Uh, Andrew Buntley, he said, uh, uh, there's no more Dr. Martin Luther King. There's no more Dr. Uh, uh, Malcolm X's. There's no more Harriet Tubman's. We all are. And what happens is we all have to take our piece, own it, do it, and uh, move forward in it. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. Create that village. Oh, I'm not going to start there, but yes. Create that village. I, I listen. I live on the on the hills of that. Uh, you know, bring back the village. I should I should make that my campaign slogan, but yes, I made something should. else. Uh, bring bring back the village. Uh, I might have to tell my team that we need to look at a new slogan called "Bring Back the Village." And yeah. the village is not just about African American people, but the village is about all people who care about humanity and the betterment of humanity. Exactly. That's what it's about. Yes. And that's where I, where I feel. I'm not a race kind of thing. Mm-hmm. I think it's people in general. You know, yeah. because as human beings, we all have the same needs. We do. Think about it. On those marches with Martin Luther King and all of those great leaders, there were a lot of um, Caucasian people that were present that had a voice in those times and was saying that what America was doing was wrong. Right. It wasn't right. And so I know that our people, uh, we need a little bit more resource, a little bit more help to help us get to where we are to be. But however, uh, the, excuse me, the village is about all of us. And when all of us stand hand in hand, and really built something great. What we do is we change the course of our society. Yes, we do. Yes, we and do. I, I think that the heart of the village is in each one of us. Yeah, it is. The change begins with me. Yes, yes. change myself because I can't change anybody else. But the change begins with me. Read that quote again. In my mind. Yes. My mindset, my attitudes, my beliefs. Yes. All of that has to change so that it becomes everyone is making those deep, deep changes. Yes. And you brought that out yes, very eloquently this evening. Yes, you did. Yeah. And believe in yes, that ma'am. you are part of something great, something bigger than you. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. I, and and I'm, I'm ending with this. Um, I've always said this, right? Uh, a young man tonight, I was at a recreational center. I was at a meeting and I stumbled into the recreational center and got a chance to talk to the director of that recreational center. Uh, he was a young guy, probably about my age or maybe a little bit younger than me. And uh, he said to me, um, he was picking my brain. And anybody that knows me, when I start talking about this kind of stuff, I'm, I get passionate because uh, I love it. Uh, sometimes my mother doesn't even know where it comes from. Like, who is this, right? Uh, I, I didn't have the luxury of seeing my father become. Uh, he passed away when I was uh, 15. Uh, so I didn't know all of what he could become. Uh, he didn't know all of what I could become, but I can imagine that who I am today is a part of what he was supposed to become. So I'm living that legacy out. However, I told him today, I said, he said, man, you know, how do I build in this environment um, when I don't know if I have the support of parents and everybody else i said one key factor you got to live beyond yourself mm-hmm. you got to give beyond yourself that's true you've got to do beyond yourself and can i be honest and this is no gloat or no praise of mine there have been plenty of times when i didn't have what i lived gave did beyond myself Same. because i realized this i realized this and folks faulted me for it right because i realized this that if i didn't have it was only going to be for a couple of days But if they didn't have, it might be for a week. And so the reality of it is I can live without it for a couple of days just to see them have right now. So the last thing I will say is live beyond, do beyond, give beyond yourself. All right. Wow. This has been a powerful, powerful conversation. I'm grateful for you guys. I'm grateful for you guys. Anytime you need me. 
please don't don't hesitate. I love you guys. You guys are like my new adopted mothers. I appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. That's an honor. <laughs> now don't be afraid to send me allowance now, okay? I take allowance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> oh wow. This has been awesome. And I'm gonna and audience is gonna definitely um get something from this because you just brought it mm-hmm. for the honest tip. And we appreciate that for sure. I appreciate it. Who knows, Ruth? (laughs) I was at the same event and I don't remember. I I guess I was so busy doing stuff that I didn't get an opportunity to You you didn't you didn't get an opportunity to come in there, but I'm quite sure there will be plenty more opportunities where you will come and uh, have, please, please. I hope you guys follow me on social media as well. Mm -hmm. I I definitely want to stay in contact. Yes, ma'am. It's on now. Yes, (laughs) ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. Absolutely. We appreciate you, and we are definitely going to be rooting for you for East Baltimore. Thank you. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. If we can do to help, we will be more than happy to help you. I appreciate it. I just want to pray that God gives you guys everything that you need to see in these lateral years of your life, that your heart will smile beyond what you can imagine, that you will leave such an impact on the future like never before. Thank you. Oh, yeah, thank, thank you, you. So much. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you. Love you guys. Appreciate Love you. you. Peace out. Word on the street says there's something new at Just Minding My Business Media. You've heard our podcast, Just Minding My Business Radio, that brings news and views you can use. That airs every Thursday at 6 p.m. on iHeartRadio, iTunes, YouTube, Spotify, and Spreaker. Well, now you can watch Just Minding My Business. That's right. Just Minding My Business Media now has a TV presence on Raven International TV Network, broadcast on Roku, Fire, and Apple TV. Your business, through Just Mighty My Business Media, has exposure on internet radio, major social media platforms, and now TV. Through Just Mighty My Business, dynamic digital marketing platform. Don't listen to the word on the street. Hear it for yourself. Visit jmmb.assistercircle.org to learn how you can take your business, your vision, to the next level. Thank you to the amazing women of Assister Circle Empowerment Network, Ascend LLC, and our media partners. Let Just Minding My Business Media promote your business. For information, visit us at jmmb.assistercircle.org. A sistercircle.org. That's J M M B dot A S I S T A S Circle dot org. Voiceovers by RCH Voiceworks. For when you want to be heard, call 443 620 4115. Thank you for tuning in to Just Minding My Business Radio. I'm your host, Ida Crawford. And I'm your co-host, Ruth Haskins. We hope you enjoy the show and appreciate you stopping by. Many blessings to you and...